welcome to this uh, video segment. We are in week three. This is our, our second segment, video segment. Uh, it's going to be a longer one, and we're going to talk about MOSFETs and gate charge and look at how the gate charge impacts the turn-on characteristics of a MOSFET. Let's go over to our outline. Um, first thing we want to do is we're going to look at an electrical model of the MOSFET, and we're going to put into that model uh, capacitance. And it's these capacitance, when you look at it from a semiconductor device, we have separation of charge and therefore we have capacitors within the MOSFET. Now, the gate to drain uh, capacitance is really what controls the turn on and turn off time. And it's called the Miller capacitance. And we end up with what's called the Miller plateau in the device. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, the charge, and we'll show some, some, some diagrams on how the MOSFETs turn on and the amount of charge that's required to turn them on. And then finally finish up with a, a simple example. I call it data sheets, data sheets, data sheets. Hopefully by now, uh, in power electronics, you are always going to the data sheets to look at characteristics of a device that are going to meet your application. And there's numbers of uh, numerous applications for us to look at. So we'll finish up with some data sheets. Let's investigate an electrical model of the MOSFET. In the model, you can see we have a capacitance between the gate and the source, labeled C, G sub S. We also have a capacitance between the gate and the drain, labeled C, G sub D. We have some internal lead resistance between the gate that we connect to, which I labeled as capital G. And in this internal node, which is truly the gate, uh, R sub G, and that is a fairly small. There's finally some a capacitor across the body diode, C drain to source. I'm not going to focus on this capacitor. It won't play critically into the turn on and turn off times for the MOSFET. We can now look at the MOSFET using a slightly different model where I've removed the MOSFET proper and looked more from its small signal model where we show the transconductance, IDS, equal to the transconductance G sub M times the gate to source. There's also a term in here called V sub theta, and V sub theta is the threshold at which the gate to source must exceed before we will start to turn the device on and get drain current flowing through the device. I want to focus a little bit more on this, this model here and look at cases first before we put a, a gate voltage on V sub G and then after the device has been turned on. Here we show two different scenarios of our model. First with our gate voltage at zero, meaning the MOSFET is off. When this is the case, we have a zero voltage across the gate to source capacitor, but we have VDC across the gate to drain capacitor. Now, when we apply a gate voltage, say 10 volts, the device will start to charge up. We will start to get current flowing. I'll show it on this model over here. We'll start to get current flowing and we will be charging up the gate to source capacitor. We'll also get a little bit of current flowing in this direction, starting to charge up the gate to drain capacitor. There will be a point, however, and in, in this diagram, we see the MOSFET is completely on and the drain voltage is approximately zero because when the device is on, this is nearly a short circuit. And so we have to go 
from discharging this capacitor, which is not necessarily in parallel with our gate to source, and then at the end of the process, our gate to drain capacitor is in parallel. And that's going to take a lot of charge to, and current to make that happen. Now let's look at a graph of this charging. And in this graph, I'm assuming we have a resistive load. And what happens as we turn on, we step this input up to V sub G. But internally, little V sub G, which is designated by this graph, starts to ramp up because current is starting to flow. And while I show it linearly, it is actually an exponential ramp up because it's a RC circuit, but I show it as a linear. While that's happening, there, we have not surpassed the threshold voltage, and so there's no current flowing through there, but there's current flowing here. That current has to flow up through here, and we'll see a slight rise on the drain voltage. Not a lot, a slight rise. And keep in mind also, I'm doing two things that probably aren't really good. I'm showing this scale as both time and charge. All of a sudden, the voltage on the gate surpa surpasses the threshold at this point, and current starts to flow this way. As the current starts to flow, the voltage on the drain will start to also come down. And all as that's happening, more current is flowing through the gate to drain capacitor. And it, it's happening such that the voltage is clamped basically internally. This plateau is called the Miller Plateau. I don't know if I spelt that right. When we look on this graph, and you'll see it on the data sheet, there's charge associated for the gate to source, and that's the charge to get it going, to actually get us to the Miller Plateau. Then there's charge associated with charging up this capacitor, our, our Miller capacitance, if you will, or the, the, the gate to drain capacitance. And then finally, after we have hit our almost steady state and our voltage has dropped, then our gate to source voltage will continue to rise up to whatever our final value is. This total charge is called Q sub G. And every data sheet will specify Q sub G. Oftentimes, they will also specify uh, the gate to source charge and the gate to drain charge required for the device. This is a resistive low turn on. Now, I'm going to look at one more, and this is going to be where we have an inductive load, and we're trying to turn on the MOSFET for an inductive load. Keep in mind, with an inductive load, when the device, and I'm assuming it's been switching on and off, when the device is opened up or turned off, this current has to flow somewhere. And let me just throw a flyback diode up here. When this flyback diode conducts, this node voltage for all practical purposes will be nearly V sub DC. And so you'll see that we will clamp that voltage for a short period of time at VDC as we're trying to turn it on. We have the same effect. The gate voltage starts to rise as we start to charge up the gate to source capacitance. It passes the threshold voltage at which point current starts to flow through the drain. Here's our drain current. And as we go up, we hit a point where now the Miller Plateau, and more often than not, the Miller Plateau is going to be a little bit wider. The gate will 
the gate voltage will be constant as we charge now this, the gate to drain capacitor, at which point the current has finally reached a maximum and our voltage has dropped to a point and now we can finish charging the rest of the circuit back up. Again, slightly different uh, load characteristics with an inductive load. We clamp the top with a resistive load. If you recall, we had a little bulge up and then the, the, the voltage started to drop. So those are the turn on characteristics of both a resistive load and an inductive load. And what I hope you're seeing is it's really the charge and how fast we can get the charge onto the device that matters on how quickly we can turn it on. Now, the data sheet I selected is for the low side switch in our JBL 50, uh, 515XT amplifier, and it's an FQP30 NO6, and let me pull that data sheet up. Here's the data sheet for the device, and one of the things you'll notice right away on the device, it says low gate charge, typically typically 15 nanocoulombs to, for, the, for the gate charge. And if we scroll down the device, you'll even see, let me get there, the, it shows the gate to source charge right there, and the gate to drain charge, which is right there. Um, the gate to source is 3.5 nanocoulombs. The gate to drain is 8.5 nanocoulombs. And our total gate charge is anywhere from 15 nanocoulombs to 20 nanocoulombs with a worst case 20. One of the things we'll keep in mind too, you have to look at what the test conditions were uh, for the device. Now let's keep going down into the device. And there's one more thing I'd like to show you. It's right here. And here you'll see the total gate charge as a, as a function of the gate to source voltage. Let me zoom in on this one a little bit. And here we have different drain to source voltages uh, that, that are associated with, with the device. And right here you can see the Miller Plateau as we start turning the device on. Let's do a quick example. I'm going to assume that we have a, a gate to source voltage drive of 10 volts. It looks like we're going to need about 26 nanocoulombs to turn this device on. So let me go and switch over to a notepad where we can do some calculations for the 26 nanocoulombs. Now let's do some calculations with that charge. Recall that the total charge we needed was equal to 26 nanocoulombs. And for the device that that's operating in, that switching amplifier, the frequency of switching is equal to 250 kilohertz. Um, so I've done some investigation on this, uh, this amplifier and it switches at 250 kilohertz. That's a switch period, which is equal to, I believe, four microseconds. If we want to turn on in one one hundredth of that time, that means we need to have our total time to turn on equal to about 40 nanoseconds. Therefore, our average current which is dq over dt, and this is average, is 26 nanocoulombs over 40 nanoseconds. And the 26 nanocoulombs was taken off the data sheet um, for that, that MOSFET device. This is equal to 0.65 amps, and that's average. The actual current for the gate, I sub q, is going to actually follow and spike up high. It'll be limited by the gate resistance, which you can add, and there will be some internal gate resistance there. Uh, oftentimes you want to add a little bit of gate resistance to dampen the ringing. So anyways, that is going to be limited by that 
gate resistance. Matter of fact, we can compute that. Uh, I peak is equal to our gate to source voltage divided by whatever we have in our gate resistance. And then it will come down. It'll hit the Miller Plateau, and I've exaggerated the Miller Plateau, and then come down again. And for, for our, the application I've chosen, we want to have this turned on within 40 nanoseconds. And this average value, which is somewhere in here, would be about 650 milliamps or 0.65 amps. So those are how you go through and start looking at the calculations because this current, this peak current that we need and how fast we drive it is going to determine what we use for what's called a gate driver and we'll explore those in later videos because um, typically you cannot turn on such a device with a microcontroller. It just cannot source the amount of current required. We can also turn the device on. I'm not going to go over the turnoff characteristics in detail. Typically, turning a MOSFET off it happens faster than turning it on. We still have the Miller Plateau in there. There's still the Miller Plateau. But the total time to, to turn off is, is a little bit faster than the time to, time to turn on. So let's talk what the key points were. Number one, the ability to provide and remove charge quickly, our DQDT, and the charge requirements for a specific device determine how fast we can turn a MOSFET on or off. Larger power MOSFETs have a larger physical area for their channel and typically require more charge to turn on and off, which means they're going to typically be slower or we're going to have to have much more gate current required to turn them on. So there's a trade-off there. Um, the gate voltage stays constant for a short period of time as the gate to drain capacitor charges up. That's called the Miller Plateau. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about as much, and we'll get into this in more detail as we continue on, is I, you may have noticed that the drain to source voltage and the drain to source current overlap while we're turning the device on and turning it off. The average of the product of those two values during that time it's call, is called switching loss, and we're going to investigate switching loss in more detail. And finally, how fast you're going to be able to turn your MOSFET on is determined by, by the total Q, and it's in the data sheet, so go look at those data sheets. Um, hope you learned a little bit more about turning MOSFETs on. There's a lot of details in this video. Um, thanks for watching.